Hey, welcome back. We're uh, part two of data collection and probability. So we're going to look at collecting data. So we spent the last class talking about different ways that your question could be biased or different things that could influence how good your data would be that you actually got. So we're going to talk today a little bit more specifically about that. So ideally, if everyone was here, we would actually work together and develop a survey question to kind of work together. But we're going to walk through the steps here and I'll show you kind of the direction we're going to take. So let's write and edit a survey question. So the whole goal of this is to uh, get rid of bias. So you'd write a question, you would review it, you would probably bounce it off a few friends, you'd bounce it off some people around you. If you work for a company, you'd talk to marketing, you would talk to probably the lawyers and they'd check to make sure your wording was all good. Uh, oh, get rid of the question. No, get rid of bias. <laughs> in the question. There we go. Don't get rid of the question. You're in a bias in the question. So you write your question, you edit it a whole bunch of times, you make sure it asks what you want to ask, you're going to get the data you want, you're not going to have as, as little bias as humanly possible in this thing. And so our step two here would be to ask everyone in the class. So let's say we were going to ask about, I don't know, let's do favorite sports. That's a nice easy one. So let's make up some results here. So we ask everyone, what is your favorite sport? Now, here comes the tricky part. What are we going to get for answers? Well, basketball, volleyball, hockey, football, those are pretty common, right? But what if somebody's really into ping pong? What if somebody's really into high ally? It's a Mexican wall ball kind of sport. So, what do you do with those people? So, you have options. Your question you can give, you have to pick from hockey, basketball, but then of course it's not as accurate. Do you have an other section where they get to fill in their own? Do you just let them write whatever they want to write and then you have to put them in categories afterwards? What do you do? So that's part of the writing and editing that makes things tricky to get rid of the bias because you also need the data to be manageable, right? But let's say we do, we survey everybody. We have, I don't know, let's say there's 20 people in the class and of these 20, we've got five that are really big into hockey. We got seven that are basketball. We got eight that are volleyball, because I like volleyball the best. Actually, here, let's go three hockey and two other. We got two ping pong players. Perfect. Actually, yeah, you know, let's just call, let's say people can write whatever they want. Let's just call them that. We had two people that were huge into ping pong. There we go. So that's all 20 people. Three hockey, seven basketball. That is basketball. Eight volleyball and two ping pong. Cool. So survey's done. We got our information. We organized the results. So maybe we go, we put them in a table. So we got... Hockey, basketball, volleyball, ping pong. And it was three, seven, eight, two. Maybe we even look at percent of people. Ooh, people. Ugh. So three out of 20. Oh, three out of 20 is you've divide those numbers at 0 0.15, so it's 15%. Seven out of 20 would be three, 35%. We'll see if my percents add up later. Eight out of 10, or sorry, eight out of 20 would be four out of 10, or 40%. And the last one, two out of 20 is one out of 10, which is 0 0.1 which is 10%. All right, so we got our percentages too. Based on the result of our class survey, predict the entire school's response to our opinion. So what do you think? Do you think that volleyball is something that 40% of our school enjoys? Do you think that 10% of our school are actually big into ping pong? Well, probably not, right? Just because our class finds this does not mean the whole school does.
So we don't think, likely, the school would match. Maybe we have way more ping pong fans. We got two guys that are crazy into ping pong here, and they might be the only ones in the whole school, right? Probably, I would say, from our results, I would think ping pong is likely too high. I would guess that hockey is probably way too low from our made-up results. And unfortunately, I do think volleyball is probably a little high. Basketball might be close, 35%. That's probably a pretty good number for basketball, one in three. So uh, if we were to try to predict it, probably wouldn't work, right? So does our prediction accurately reflect the opinions? I guess we kind of answered that there. No, it probably wouldn't. Why? So I'll do the explain. Our class has fewer people which means one or two people with a specific interest, for example, in our case, uh, ping pong, they really skew the results. So when you're not asking many people, your results get a little bit crazy, a lot faster. It's like the very beginning of the year. If I'm trying to figure out what my marks are and everyone's only handed in one assignment, well, guess what? If you had a rough go and you got four out of 10 on that assignment, your entire school mark is now 40%. And then you write a second assignment. And let's say you ace that second assignment. Well, now I have to average the four and the 10. Let's say it was 10 out of 10. So it's the average of four and 10, seven. So now you're up to 70%. Your mark went from 40 to 70. It jumped 30%. You only handed in one thing. Why? Well, because we had fewer data points. If you have fewer data points, each data point has way more importance. It looks way bigger than it really is. So if you're looking at just a class, a couple people's opinions being a little different or a little, our interest being a little off of what the entire school would be has a huge difference on what our results would be. So you'd want to make sure you'd have a lot more people and you don't want to take them all from the same spot. So terminology for today. First, population. When we're talking about a population, we mean an entire set of items from which data can be taken. Now, population doesn't necessarily have to be absolutely everybody everywhere. You can specify a population. So for example, you could say all students in Neverville High School. That would be a population. You could say all students in Hanover, that would be a population, be a bigger population. You could say all students in Canada, if you wanted, Can Canada. It doesn't have to be students, right? You could also have all people in Niverville. I want the population of Niverville. So if I have a question that is Niverville centric, so what do we name the new high school? For example, my population for that would be Niverville. I don't care about anybody else. They don't live here. They have nothing to do with our school. I want to survey all the people in our town, all people who have a stakes in the actual school building. So it's just an entire set of items from which data can be taken, but you're including everyone. A sample would be a selection from your population. So this would be one class in Neverville High School. It could be one school in Hanover. Your population could be males in Canada only. Maybe you don't want to ask the females for some reason. So you're going to take a sample of that population. So of all people in Neverville, maybe you take every 10th person from, I don't even know if this exists, the Neverville phone book. Does Neverville have a phone book? Does anyone have a phone book anymore? I don't know. But if you were to take every person from that Neverville phone book, that'd be a sample. And so you need to find different ways of sampling people. 
Uh, actually, let's go back here and talk for a second about this one. Sample, really, really, really important. We're going to spend a lot of time today talking about samples, and I want to tell you why before we get into it. If I needed information about something, population will give you your best data. If I want to know something about Neverville, I want to ask every student in Neverville. I'll get my most accurate information. What is the trade-off to trying to ask every student in a high school? It takes forever. It would be more expensive. You're much more likely to run into that thing we talked about last lesson about cost versus benefit. So most of the time, I'd say probably the vast majority of the time, we run a sample instead. We would take, you know, 10% of the students in Neverville High School. And we try to make it as random as possible, as bias-free as possible. We try to use a sample. So we gather less information and try to make that information as accurate as possible. That saves us time. It saves us money. It allows the data to be easier to work with because there's less of it. So samples are super important. You would almost, ne well, you would never ask every student in Canada. It's not going to happen, ever. But they might sample certain schools across Canada and try to make sure there's an even spread of English schools, French schools, independent schools, uh, First Nation schools, schools from a different provinces. Like if you split that all up and you get them evenly selected, you might have a good view of all students in Canada, right? And it's a lot easier to do five, six schools per province than it is to do every single student. Anyway, how do you get your information? There's two ways. One is primary data gathering and that's what we were going to be looking at mostly in this unit this means you gather your own data you design your own question you figure out who you want to ask you figure out who your sample is going to be you actually go out and ask the people you use google forms you use a paper survey you send out a mail you ask people in person wherever you go you are gathering your own data the second way of gathering data is called the secondary ga data gathering which means someone else did it already you just have to go find it so secondary data gathering is probably a lot of what you've been doing in interdisciplinary, where you're using Google to find stuff that other people did, and you're putting it together with your own ideas to make sense of things. So you're looking at a bunch of different people's information, you put it all together to kind of maybe find a trend, figure something out, like maybe somebody already asked who are the favorite sports teams in Manitoba are. Maybe they didn't, and you're going to have to go look at Maybe jersey sales are posted. How many jerseys did the Jets sell versus the Bombers versus uh, what's the name of the soccer club? FC Valor. So by using jersey sales, maybe you could infer who the most popular sports team was. You know what I mean? So you could gather data from different places and try to use that to answer your question. But you're not actually going out and just asking people yourself. All right, example one. Let's identify the population for the situation. And then, should we survey the entire population or just sample them and explain your reasoning? Now, before we get into this, generally speaking, population. If it is small, do them all. There's my saying for the day. If the population's small, survey them all. That's the idea, because then you're going to have the most accurate situation. Sample. You're going to use that if the population is big. I have no fancy saying for this. I'm sorry. If your population is really big, you're going to want to sample it instead because it's just going to be too hard otherwise. If someone can think of a real fancy saying for this, you just put it in the comments and I will re-record this entire video just for that. I, I probably won't, but I'd, be, I'd love to hear if you guys had some fancy uh, sayings for this one here. Some little rhymes. So A. Bicycle store owner wants to know which brand of mountain bike her customers prefer. So, step one, what is the population? Let's identify the population. So, who is she trying to survey? Bicycle store owner wants to know which brand of her customers prefer. So, she is looking, her population is all customers of the bike store. So it doesn't matter if they bought a bike, if they came in and bought, you know, a chain or a wrench or a helmet, anyone, all customers of the bike store, that is her population. Now, do we survey population or a sample? Now, again, this is up in the air. A lot of the questions in this unit can go, can go either way. What really is important is your thinking behind it. So I've seen both answers. I've seen 
survey the population because you have information on everyone from receipts so you should be able to get in contact with them quite easily and there aren't many people so in that case yeah survey the population that makes a lot of sense right we got information on everybody anyone who's made a purchase we have a receipt probably from that we can get phone numbers or information on them we should be able to get in contact with all these people and there aren't that many of them. It's just whoever came in and bought. It's not like we're Walmart with 1,000 people a day coming through. It's a little bike store. Some people say, no, no, no. We need to do a sample here. Because what about people who didn't buy anything? We don't have any information on them. They came into our store and then they left. Doesn't mean they didn't want to buy anything. Maybe we didn't have the brand they wanted. And this question would be super important for them. What brand do they prefer? We could have had a sale if we knew that. How else would we get the information on the entire population? So they would say that your population has a big bias in it and that you're only getting people who purchased. You're missing out. So what about your non-buyers? How do you get that info? Maybe instead of that, we ask people as they enter the store. Now we are getting everyone who comes into our store. We could run this for a one month period. We could sample them all. Now, is this all customers of our bike store? Well, obviously not. We didn't get everyone in our past. We don't know everyone from the future, but we might capture all the customers for a small window of time. Like maybe I am a fat tire mountain biker, right? I like to bike in the winter with the big fat tires. Well, if they run the survey in the summer, they're not going to get me. Even though I am a customer and I bought stuff before and I'm going to buy stuff again, they might just miss me because of the timing of it. So it's still a sample. You're only sampling the people who are coming into the store for a certain amount of time. It's not all customers. So both these answers are correct. They both have justifications. Your information on everyone, you've got your receipts, there aren't that many people. That's a good reason to survey a population. And the people who said, no, let's, let's use the sample. We just ask people who are in the store because we're missing out on non-buyers. This way we're going to get everyone, whether they buy or not, who come through. Both are right answers. Both have shown good thinking. So as long as you describe why and have some good reasoning behind it, it doesn't matter which answer you pick. There are some times when the answer is a lot more obvious than others, but if you can justify the non-obvious answer, quote unquote, I'm fine with that as long as your explanation makes sense and is sound. Hey, here's one that's pretty topical, hey? School board wants to know how many hours of homework students do each day. So we got the school board, so that would be for a specific division, I would assume. So you would have a population, all students in the division. That's your population. We know all students in our division, whatever the school board's division is, we need to find out how many hours of homework they're doing. So we're going to ask the students. They're the ones who know, right? So what do you think? Is it a population or a sample? Do they send out an email to every single student in the division and hope they check their emails and respond? Do they pick certain schools? and they ask the teachers to hunt them down and make sure they get a response from everyone? Do they email every 10th student by student number across the entire division? How would you do that? And again, there's, there's justifications both ways here. You can say that, you know, it's a school division. We have every single student email. It'd be easy to send out a population email blast. The problem with that, of course, being that not everyone's going to respond. How do you enforce it and make them respond? What do you do to people who don't have email or don't check their emails? What do you do there? Even though we have an email account, they never use it. Uh, or we could sample. You could put some teachers in charge of it and say, all right, we're going to pick every fifth class from the division. We're just going to put all the classes in order. Pick every fifth class and tell the teacher you need to get a response from the, all of your students. And so... If I was chosen, if I was one of the unlucky one in five, I would have to put out a survey in class probably to all of the students, say, hey, how many hours are you doing? I'd jot it all down and I'd send it into the division as a report. Now they get less information that way, only one out of every five classes, but they're probably gonna get more accurate information because the teachers would be doing it directly.
So both, again, justifiable. Totally up to whichever way you think would make the most sense. C, a candle manufacturer wants to know how many of its candles are made with flaws. So your population, all candles from the candle factory. I'll just call it factory. All candles from the factory. There we go. So candle guy, manufacturer, they got a factory, it's pumping out candles. How many of these candles are busted? How many have flaws? How many aren't coming out quite right? So here's one that has a pretty obvious answer. In order to check if a candle has a flaw, what would you have to do? Well, you'd have to open the box with all the candles in it. You'd have to root through every single candle. You'd have to open them all and take a look at them and inspect them by hand, which means you'd then have to rewrap them all. Do you really want to package up all of your candles, then unpackage all of your candles, then repackage all of your candles so you could send them out? No, not a chance. So this one I'm going to say is pretty obvious that you want to sample this. Take... I don't know how many candles you make in a day at a candle factory, but let's say we take every 100th candle and inspect it. And we do this for months. We just, no, you know what? Do this forever. Let's make this part of our manufacturing process. Every 100th candle, pull it off and take a look. And let's say on average that... 2.3 candles. So this is over a long period of time. On average, 2.3 candles. So sometimes it's two, sometimes it's three. Out of 100 are broken. Well, then you know that you probably have around a 2.3% flaw rate, which would be really high, I would think. You'd have to go back and check and see where are these candles getting broken and try and fix it, and then just keep sampling and see if you can get that number to drop, right? So this would definitely be one where you'd want to sample, and this is a really common thing that most factories do. It's called quality control. They take a sample, and it's not every hundredth, it might be every thousandth, however many stuff they produce, and they just find, like, what percent are broken? Is it, like... 2.3 out of 100? Is it 0 0.2 out of 100? How many candles on average are broken? After I've drawn a thousand candles from my pool, after, you know, a hundred thousand candles have gone by and I've pulled every hundredth and I've got a thousand samples here, what percent are actually broken? That'll give me a ballpark estimate of how many should actually be broken out of my, out of my factory. Because I'm just doing it kind of at random, every hundredth. doesn't matter where the candle was, or where, it's just, just going to pull it and see what happens. So, types of samples now. So that was all sampling versus population. Now that we've talked a bit about sampling and why it's important, there's so many different ways to take a sample. Some are really good, some are really bad. First one's a convenient sample. Choose a sample that's handy. It gives you par, yeah, probably the worst results out there, but it's really easy. So for example, Ask your friends. They're right beside you, right? They're sitting in class with you. Just ask them what, you know, what their favorite food is. That's what we'll put on the lunch menu for the entire division. Just ask your friends. Less reliable, because your friends are likely have common interests. They will likely be more similar to you, because you guys are already friends. Um, there's going to be a ton of bias there. But it's really easy to do that kind of sample. Second is a random sample. So you select items at random from a population. Now you could do this with a computer program. Uh, you could do it by drawing names out of a hat. Hat draw. So every item has an equal chance of being selected. So, oh, well, those are my examples right there. Yoink. So like for, you see a lot of times the teacher's like, hey, we are gonna make groups. I just hit the random button on my computer and it puts, just randomly draws things. That's just kind of the way it works. So that would be random sampling. So if I had a question, I could just hit random button. I could put everyone's name in a hat. I could pull it out. Everyone has a random chance of being selected. Now, downside to this one. Now, it's not as obviously biased as this one is. The downside to this is you don't know the bias ahead of time.
Like at least with the convenient sample, you know that your friends are like you. You know what their likely biases are. With a random sample, I don't know ahead of time. Let's say I pick five names at random from our class. I could get all girls. I could get all boys. I could get all people who are on the hockey team. I could get, randomly, all people who have not had their birthday yet or who have had their birthday yet. You see what I'm saying? There's some bias that could happen. It's less likely, but there could be some bias there, and I'll have no idea what it is because I'm not planning for it. I might not even know those five people are all on the hockey team, right? So you got to be a little careful with random samples. If you have a really big random sample, it's usually good. The large randomness tends to weed out what's going on. Uh, it would weed out the chance of drawing all five people from the hockey team. But that's always the thing. You have no idea what your selection actually is because it's been random. Stratified is a way to fix this. You divide your population into groups and you select items at random from the groups. So I need a school survey. So what I do is I break the school into grades. I got grade 12, grade 11, grade 10, grade 9. I've now stratified them. So I'm going to make sure I get an even selection by grade. My ages will be even. And then I'm going to take, you know, 25% of my grade 12s, 25% of my grade 11s, 25% of my grade 9s, 25% of my grade 10s. That way I get a 25% sample of the whole school. So let's say there was 100, if there was 100 in each grade, I'd get 25 kids in 12, 25 kids in 11, 25 kids in 10, 20, 20. So I'd have 100 out of 400 students. I'd get a quarter of the school. But I know this 25% is going to be selected randomly but I know that I've got an even breakdown of age because I stratified by age. Does that make That should probably make sense, I think, right? You break it down into certain categories, that guarantees it's less. Like, if I were to do a true random sample, I could, theoretically, pull 100 grade nines out of the 400 students. Randomly selecting people, and all of them happen to be grade nines. I wouldn't know that bias was happening, but it would be huge. Stratified forces it to not be around. Now, I could still get all girls. It could still happen that way. But I've already stratified out one of the random things, right? So it helps make it a little bit better when you stratify. It's actually a lot better. Uh, systematic. You just choose individuals at fixed intervals from an ordered list of the whole population. So I take the phone book. They're ordered by alphabetically by name. And I take every 10th person. That's systematic. I can look at your student numbers. Put the whole school in by student number and then take every 20th. Why not? I want less people. So you just rip down the student number list. Boop, 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 boop. Every 20th number, that's who I'm going to survey. I don't care what grade they're in, what age, what male, female, and it doesn't matter. I just, every 20th student, and uh, the reason this kind of works nicely is because it's an ordered list. Depending on how the list is ordered, it kind of stratifies as well. So, for example, if student numbers are assigned when you enroll, those numbers should get higher and higher as you are younger and younger, which means if you put them in order by student number, you're going to be breaking it down by age, basically. And by taking every 20th, you're guaranteed an even split of ages across the entire school, at least for grade 11, 12, 10, 9. 12, 11, 10, 9, yeah. Phone book, alphabetical doesn't really do much for you stratification ways unless you really care about only asking people with certain last names or something like that. That'd be weird. But depending on how you order your list, you can actually use that to make your sample even better. Last one, real bad one, voluntary response sample. So this is, I leave a box out by the cafeteria that says, what's your favorite food? Box by the canteen. And you can answer if you want. I put a little thing in the announcements. It says, hey, there's a box. If you like hot dogs, go put something in the box. And so some people answer, some won't. The reason this is bad, you only get two types of responses. You get those who really really love something and you get those 
who really, really hate something. They're the only ones that care enough to respond. If you're kind of like, meh, I'll eat whatever they serve, you're just not going to bother responding. But if you're like, oh man, I cannot live if I do not eat pizza pops three times a week, they're the greatest food ever invented, and I need these in my belly now, you will write a response because you are addicted to pizza pops apparently, and you might want to get that checked out. On the flip side, if you were like, I cannot stand broccoli. If I have to eat broccoli, I will retch. If broccoli is even served in this school, I will throw a hissy fit. You would likely go and write a response and be like, make whatever you want. Just don't put broccoli in the food. So if you really love or really hate something, you get a response. But the vast majority of people are kind of in between. Most people don't care that much about pizza pops or broccoli. The broccoli shows up cool. I'm just not going to buy lunch that day. The pizza pops are there. Oh, that'll be nice. I'll have a treat. But most people aren't that passionate about it. So you only get kind of your extremist responses if you do a voluntary response sample. So example two here, for each situation, describe how the sample could be selected, identify the type of sample. And again, there are so many correct answers for this. And incorrect, it doesn't say you have to pick a good sample. You can pick any of those above. You can say voluntary response for this. I'm just gonna go ask my buddies. That would be correct. That is, as long as you've identified the type of sample and explained how you would do it. Now, keep in mind, you don't want to use the same one every time. Let's look at some different examples here. But a teacher wishes to get feedback from her class about the school dance. She wants to survey five students out of a class of 30. Cool. So as a teacher, wasn't my job. I should be able to figure this one out. How do I survey five kids out of a class of 30? My go-to is random. Why? Because it's super easy to find random pickers on the computer. I input the 30 names, I hit go, and I will get five kids randomly. Fine. A, school dance, I don't care that much about this. It doesn't need to be crazy accurate. I'm not too worried about bias between like age or gender or whatever else is going on. It doesn't matter. It's just random. So let's just get some feedback. Let's just pick five students, see what they think. So that to me would be the easiest and probably still be useful. So how would I do it? Random picker on the computer. That would be my description. That's a pretty easy one. What about a telephone company? They want to determine whether a fitness center would be used by 3,000 employees. So this is a big company, 3,000 people. And they're wanting to install maybe a fitness room. Are they going to use it? They want to survey 300 employees. All right, now this one is a little bit more... A little bit more on the line here, right? I got to put a lot of money into this fitness center if I'm going to be building one. And I need to make sure it's being used. So I'm not just going to go random here. I want to be a little more precise. And I'm not just going to ask my 300 buddies because this is pretty important. So maybe I want to do this one. Let's go systematically. And you know what? There's so many different ways you can do it systematically. And I'm just I'm making stuff up as I go. But I'm going to do it systematically. So I'm going to make a list. of employees, and you know what I'm going to base it on? I'm going to do it by salary. I want to see what they're paid. You know why? Because maybe there's a difference in what my CEO wants and what the people at the bottom of it, my new hires, my you know people that are just starting out, the ones that are lower down on the list there. Maybe there's a difference in what they need. And I might be able to see that if I do them by salary. So this way, I'm guaranteed to not just get all my higher ups in the company, and I'm not guaranteed to just get all the people at the bottom of the rung. Now, if I have a lot of people that are not making very much money, they're going to show up more often. And so maybe that's something I want to kind of take account of. So I'll make a list of employees by salary and take every, oh, take every what? Well, I want 300 people out of 3,000. 3,000 divided by 300. I need to take every 10th person. You might have been able to figure that out without doing the math, but I wanted to show it. So if I take every 10th person down my list of employees by salary, I will have a systematic sample that should give me a good look of everyone in the company across kind of what they earn. A chain store, that's Walmart or something like that, right? They got a bunch of stores. They're trying whether to open a store in Camrose, Alberta. 
The company wants to survey people in Camrose, obviously, and three nearby towns. So let's say you were going to open a, t- a big, I don't know, what would be a good big, an Ikea. We're going to open an Ikea here in Niverville. Well, obviously, we're going to pull people in that are not just from Niverville, right? So we would ask around at like Grunthal and Steinbach and Laurent and Deschaines and Blue Mort and Rosener, all those areas around here. We would ask all the towns in the area. So that's what they're doing. They're going to ask Camrose and the nearby towns. Now, the population of each town is shown before. How do we sample these guys? Now, this is a bit trickier because, like, look at the population differences, right? If I take, like, a random sample, I'm only going to get people from here. Statistically speaking, the odds of me getting someone else are pretty slim, right? I'll probably just get people from Camrose, which eliminates the whole point of the survey. So you know what I should do? I know what I should do. I should do a stratified sample. So I'm going to break it down by town. I'm going to take Camrose and Bashaw and Toefield yeah, and Daysland. That sounds nice. I live in Daysland. And I'm going to take 10% of each of each town, roughly. Which means I'm going to ask 1,600 people from Camrose, which makes sense. They should have a lot of people. They're the biggest town. I'm going to ask 82 and a half, so I'll call it 83. 80 people from Bashaw. I'll ask 188 from Tofield, and I'll ask 88 from Daysland. Now, each town is equally represented population-wise. They don't have the same number of people, nor should they. Camrose is a way higher population. But now each of them are getting 10% of their population chosen. So I'd go randomly, or maybe I'd even use these numbers and figure out a way to do it systematically. That's kind of up to you. But I would say, okay, these are the people I got to get in touch with. How would I do this? Probably, honestly, I'd do systematically. It's easy enough with the phone book, right? So how do I actually set this up? Use a phone book systematically. So you'd figure out how many numbers to skip. You'd go through the names and the numbers and make sure you get that number of people as you go through. Marketing research company mails surveys to all the adult residents in a town. The survey asks about brands of consumer products. The residents are asked to mail their responses in a prepaid envelope. Well, this isn't a very good question. This is, this is an answer. I should have reworded this now that I read it out loud. Yeah, so, okay, they're apparently surveying all the adult residents, asking about brands of products, and asked to mail their responses up in a prepaid envelope. So if you had to do this, Let's say we have to do this again. That's what we're going to do. We're going to do this one again. Because right now they're doing the population and it's not working, right? We're going to say prepaid envelope. Nobody's mailing it back. You have been put in charge of making a new sample. So you've got this town. We don't know what the name of the town is. Townsville. So we got Townsville and you have to sample the residents. We've tried mail bombing them. It didn't work out. How would you sample the residents? Now, this one, you have very little information about it other than it's about brands of consumer products. So, I mean, this one's up to you. You could do random, you could do stratified, you could stratify it by neighborhood, you could do systematic, go down through the phone book again. What would probably be easiest, in my mind, probably systematic with the phone book because you've already got it with, you've already got a list of everyone in town in that phone book. And so you could just go down and maybe call them and ask what they wanted, depending on what the value of this is. But, uh, I mean, that's up to you. There's a lot of different ways you could justify how you wanted to run this uh, survey. Restaurant owner wants to know the favorite pizza topping of his customers. Pineapple, obviously. He plans to survey every customer who orders a pizza in his restaurant between 5 p.m. and 10 p.m. one evening. So, what's... Okay, I think we veered off. I think we're back into bias now, aren't we? Describe how the sample could be selected. Oh yeah, so we've got the population again. So he wants to survey every customer, but is there a way that we could do a sample instead of every customer? Is there any way we could sample this? So right now he's saying he wants to talk to every customer who orders a pizza. How would you actually run this? Would it be on you know on the receipt, fill out the survey, and you can win a win a free drink next time you come in? Would it be, hey, you need to answer this before we give you your bill? <laughs> like, what are you going to do, right? How would you actually set this up? So I'm going to leave this one open-ended. But the idea is, 
I want you guys to think about in real life, how would you actually run this? Don't just be like, oh yeah, I would just tell every customer. How would you do that? That's the important part. Is it on the receipt? And if so, what are the downsides of that? What are the upsides of that? Again, these don't have to work, but I need to know you've thought about it. So on the receipt, upside, everyone gets one. You have asked everyone in the restaurant. Downside, who actually answers those things? If it's on the receipt, how many people actually fill it out for the free drink? Also, it's going to cost you money. It's going to cost you a free drink if they're going to answer it. If that's what you're doing. How else could you do it? Well, you could actually like stop people as they come in before they sit down. Positive. Everyone answers. They have to or they're not allowed in. What's the downside to that? Well, you might lose some business as people like, don't want to give you answers, right? Or back to the right to respond, you might have bad answers because they're being forced to respond before they're allowed to have their pizza. So as long as you can figure out, how am I going to set this up? What are the pros and cons of this, doing it this way? You're probably good to go. And that's it. That's all we got for today. So look forward to an announcement probably posting early next week or uh, in the time to come here. And again, if you can think of a good rhyme for that one, add it, uh, add it in the comments. Thanks, guys.